I've killed all the enemies and untied these guys and still they stand here cowering and screaming for help. Maybe I'm just that scary. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. I'm Josh Dreyfus and I've spent years playing the best MMO games available. Now it's time to do the opposite and find the worst of the worst. I'm going to play them all so you don't have to. Join me on my journey through the most awful MMOs I can find. Drop a like on the vid and sub to the channel for more awful MMOs and ring the bell so you don't miss a single video. Today, we're playing Defiance 2050. It's on Steam, it's free, and it's just over 16 gigs. Description tells me it's a massively multiplayer online third-person shooter. It proudly displays its Metacritic rating of 48 and is made by Tryon. Hang on, Tryon Worlds, I know that name. They are the guys that made both Rift and Arcage, two actually pretty popular MMOs for their time, so maybe this will be good. It then describes itself as a shooter like no other. I mean, I can think of at least two MMO shooters that it might be trying to be like. The original Defiance came out in 1997 and was an offline first-person shooter. Then, in 2013, the MMO version released, also called Defiance, because coming up with names is difficult. This version came out for the PS3, Xbox 360 and PC. Reviews were not kind and it scored 5 out of 10 from pretty much everyone. Now, Defiance 2050 is the updated version. It features exactly the same maps, quests, mechanics, and gameplay as the first version, but the playable classes have been tweaked a bit. Also, this game franchise spawned a spin-off TV show on the Sci-Fi Channel, which, by all accounts, is actually pretty damn good. Downloading it from Steam still requires you to install the Glyph Launcher, Tryon's own launcher that holds all its other games. I suppose I may as well, because I'll need this for when I play Rift and Arcage. The intro cinematic starts and at first it's just text on a soft background, but then it actually gets really good. Set on a military spaceship, we're shown the captain shouting at some science dude. Listen. And the captain's voice acting is spot on, like this guy is really, really good. I tried to look up the voice cast online and the IMDB page for this game is just blank. There's no info, anywhere, even on the official forums. I had to go back into the game's settings menu and read the credits to find anything, and still there's no list of voice actors. But I did discover this game's music score was done by Bear McCreary, who is known for his amazing work on the rebooted Battlestar Galactica TV show and the latest God of War game. Character creation's fine. You've got three major races to choose, but they all look vaguely human, so it comes across as more human race, punk human race, and sick human race. I went with regular human. Four classes, assault, assassin, guardian, and medic, so mid-range, long-range, tank, and healer. I'll likely be playing solo, so the mid-range seems fine. Voice, eyes, and hair customization next. It's all moving from screen to screen. Next time, just put all the customization stuff on one screen and have sliders on the left-hand side for things. That's how everyone else does it. While playing around with the beard settings, I somehow, through complete accident, managed to recreate Tom Selleck, and I'm okay with this. Intro movie carries on, we are introduced to two side characters, a pair of arc hunters called Josh, good name, and Irissa. We also won't learn anything about them until later. The ship we're on, as is customary in video game openings, gets shot down and we crash land. Our escape pod is found by some lady who opens the pod. We stumble around for a bit and suffer from some really bad migraines and then she runs off. The migraines come from something called an ego chip, a neural implant we have that creates this floating torso lady. She basically helps us use the map and generally guides us. This is fine, it's a sci-fi game. I can get behind neural implants. Now the game starts and the first thing I notice is how beautifully smooth it is. I am so happy to finally play a game that actually runs properly. Controls are standard WASD, space is jump, it's a third person shooter, but you can't zoom in or out. The mouse wheel instead switches between whatever two weapons you have equipped. The user interface is great. Recharging shield meter, similar to Halo to the top left, actual health under that. Weapon and ammo count in the bottom left, minimap in the top right. It's instantly recognizable and understandable. There's no major innovation here, but hey, if it does what it needs to do, there doesn't have to be. The Ego unit tells me to go and find stuff, so I do. The game lets me know I can switch between weapons with the Q key. Then it's time for the first test. High graphics! Will it crash like all the others have and... No! Amazingly, it won't. It switches seamlessly, 
and it looks great. The next quest gets me to investigate some rubble, and the moment I do, it explodes and I'm thrown into combat, so let's talk about the gunplay. It's really, really good. Not joking, this gunplay is great. Right click to aim down the sights, left is fire, R is reload. The aiming reticle narrows whether you're aiming or standing still for more accurate shots. The visuals of each bullet are lovely yellow streaks of light, the sound effects of the shots are loud, and the bloody impact of bullets into the enemy is deep and satisfying. This is a perfect example of what happens when everything just works. After the first few battles, I hop into the settings and turn auto-aim off. I want to feel fully in control. Now we're shown our ego power. Pressing 1 activates it, and mine is a super sprint. I'll go blurry and run super fast for a bit. But the regular sprint lasts forever, which is a nice change from what most games choose to do. You'll find these ammo crates around, which are infinite bullet refill points, so you can stock up, but then you have to push forward to the next one. My ego implant needs to hack into this thorium reactor. Reminds me a bit of the scene in Independence Day. Not everything can hack into everything else, but okay, I guess it's a plot device. Now we're given an area hold mission, and then momentary use of a super overpowered minigun. It's a nice touch when a game gives you an early taste of power and then takes it away. It reminds us that we are currently weak, but lets us know what we're working towards. Another cutscene, and this lady says we'll make a great team. Maybe slow down there, Sparky. We've just met, and I don't know you, so let's have a little bit of character development before we start teaming up. Then my character says something that makes me twitch. Ah, life on the new frontier. No, don't ever compare yourself to that game. It was awful, and you, so far, are actually pretty good. We need to go and find the original science dude that was on the ship, because he apparently is my boss and has the alien MacGuffin that we all need, so we search the nearby drop pods. Some of these burnt character models are actually quite disgusting, especially how the charred fingers have curled up into claws. I do like how my ego unit identifies this body as super critical to the mission, but then just doesn't give them a name. I guess they weren't that important if they aren't named. This firefight between the survivors of the wreck and the mutant soldiers of the planet, with the crashed ship on the right and the swamp on the left, is really, really nice. The NPCs of both sides are actually firing at and hitting the other. It's a proper battle. I find a makeshift base just up a hill and wonder how. Either the ship crashed right next to a temporary camp, which is super convenient, or they've managed to build this camp within 15 minutes of crashing. The captain is alive, somehow, and we're treated to another great cinematic, and then we finish the first mission. Let's check out the world map. Left click drags it, and right click adds a waypoint marker, but the game also adds a purple route, showing us how to actually get to the waypoint that we set, and it takes into account mountains and stuff, which is really handy. Seems we can also fast travel to any location we've been to before, but I'm not going to do that while exploring. We can see the main missions, side missions, and local arc falls, which I'll cover later. The map's fine, and so the inventory is next, and that's also fine. I can see my items, they're arranged into tabs, and nothing seems graphically wrong. To see what we're equipped with, we have to open the loadouts menu. We can have two active weapons, a style of grenade, a shield. It's very Borderlands, which is not a bad thing. I set off and follow the marker about 15 minutes in while exploring this destroyed multi-story car park. I just think to myself, this is brilliant. The scenery isn't quite up to the standard of Fallout, but it's definitely better than most. The proportions are great, there's rubble and debris everywhere, the camera is doing exactly what it needs to do, the gunplay is solid. This, so far, is really fun to play. Walking around, I stumble onto a dynamic quest, stuff that just happens in the world and I can choose to get involved with. These guys are pinned down and need some help, and honestly, this was really good fun. The only thing that spoiled it was how after I'd killed the enemies and freed them, the sound cues didn't change and they kept screaming for help. You won't regret this. Another 15 minutes in and I'm not even starting to get bored. This is good. But I realised I never took off the custom map waypoint from earlier, and I've accidentally been following that instead of the quest marker, so I have to run all the way back. 
bite a little bit more off than I can chew with this shootout. My shield gets drained and I get killed, but it seems you've got a self-revive mechanic. It recharges over several minutes and basically allows you to get yourself back into the fight almost instantly. It's a nice, forgiving way of letting you know when you've pushed a bit too hard and maybe you need to fall back and play a little bit smarter. It does seem, however, that if you're far enough away from some of the melee enemies, they will just stand there and let you shoot them. There's a ladder. Can you climb it? Yes, and it's an automatic action. You don't even need to press anything, you just run toward it. And while you're on top, can you jump off and shoot while you're in the air? Also yes. While in a battle, pressing the ALT key makes you roll. This will dodge incoming fire and avoid melee attacks, but you need to wait a few seconds between dodges. The dodge mechanic is perfect. It's enough distance to matter, it's not too much to be unfair, and you come out of the roll animation straight into a shooting stance. Whoever animated this did a damn good job. Just as I'm having a great time, I need to leave the keyboard and go and answer the door, and when I return, it seems the quest broke. I needed to clear out this area, which I did. Then an elite enemy spawned as part of the scripted quest. It killed me, and now I'm revived, but the quest seems to have just stopped. It won't even reset. Even if I leave the area and return, there's no enemies to kill or scenery to destroy, and it tells me I need to secure the area. It doesn't get much more secure than being empty. I try to fix it for a while, I even scour the key bindings for a quest button but I can't find one. The last thing I try, unfortunately, is to log out and log back in, which is a shame because the game had a good flow going up to now. Logging back in does indeed fix it, the quest resets and the fun returns. Plus, it's night time now, so the muzzle flashes light up the surrounding area and these snipers are using laser sights, which isn't realistic but does look awesome in the darkness. A word about the firefight events, such as quest areas or condensed enemies within scenery. These encounters are good enough without the music, but when you add in the brilliant score, it cranks it up so much more. This firefight actually got my adrenaline going. The boss is an elite enemy with a grenade launcher, but a well-timed dodge helps you avoid the knockback effect of explosions and a few bullets make short work of him. Finishing the mission unlocks the first vehicle, a small quad bike called a runner. You can summon your runner from anywhere by pressing V. Let's give it a drive and it handles great. Good turning, nice headlight effect and recharging nitro. This is going to make getting around a lot more fun. Can you run over enemies? Yes, you can. But the vehicle also has health and if it gets shot too much, it will explode, throwing you prone to the ground. Also, if you get off the vehicle while moving, you do this cool combat roll straight into a shooting stance. The next mission needs me to find three generators, and every time I stop playing to write some note down, more enemies spawn or hop out of some nearby van and attack me. This game really needs you to be focusing, and it keeps the pressure up. It doesn't let you rest or slow down. When I finish the mission, or any sub-objective within a mission, it seems enemies spawn. It's likely to be a scripted event. When you make progress, enemies will happen, so I'll keep this in mind and I'll check this theory later. The doors to this building are locked, but we need to get up to the balcony, so we head around the back and do some platforming, jumping up onto the ledge. I'm fine with this. If you're going to include a jumping mechanic in your game, at least use it for level design. Theory confirmed, in the moment I complete this sub-objective, enemies spawn. At least I know I need to reload before doing anything. Another dynamic event, I throw myself into it and almost get destroyed. This game is way more tactical than it looks, so I need to hang back and pick off enemies one at a time. The moment I find a sniper rifle, this game will get a lot easier. My next quest sees me rescuing some trapped soldiers from an overlooked plaza, but this is actually the same as a dynamic event I did earlier, which makes me think maybe the quests players are on show up on the world map to other players and you're able to help out. I'll test this theory later. This firefight lasts a bit longer than usual, but honestly I'm not even watching the clock. This core gameplay loop is really good. 
Find my first bit of loot, a green gun. Picking something up automatically equips it, which is good and bad. It's nice that I get to see what it does and play with a new toy instantly, but if I had a good gun already, I'm forced to go back into my loadouts and swap back. Notice something good about the combat. The guns have ranges, and the further away you are, the less damage you do. As I'm a mid-range assault class, it's actually best for me to be constantly advancing on targets, so my guns are doing the maximum damage. It's a nice mechanic. It prevents camping and keeps the action fast. I forgot that my runner vehicle has health and accidentally drive it into enemy fire, making it explode. Then an awesome unscripted moment. Pressing F performs melee attacks, so I sprint at this enemy and melee attack, which ends up knocking him over the balcony. It made me happy to see that you can do that. Test out some dynamic entrances on my vehicle, ride into the enemy, jump off and go straight to shooting. Actually makes me feel kinda cool. Find a grenade launcher, get super excited. Fire grenade launcher and see it's really weak, get super disappointed. Then another discovery. A grenade will do some damage, but a melee attack will do more damage and stagger the enemy, meaning my most deadly tactic is to sprint from enemy to enemy, punching them to death. This tactic does mean my shield takes an absolute beating, but I am killing enemies way quicker. Feels a bit strange to have access to all these guns and be focusing on a melee build, but hey, whatever works. Clear the bad guys out, rescue the medical supplies, and back to base. Wonder if honking the horn warns enemies to get out of your way. It does not. The bridge ahead is destroyed, so I'm going to go for an epic nitro jump over it. Just got to reverse a little and line up the jump and... Oh, well I... I ruined that, didn't I? Finishing this quest needs me to return a valuable item, so instead of taking it to the captain in person, I just chuck it in the mailbox. Don't worry, the planet may be war-torn and infested with insane mutant soldiers, but the post office are still keeping a regular schedule. Fill in the captain on the situation. He sends me and the lady who rescued me off to fix a radio antenna. In a nice touch, the captain character is actually visibly unhappy to be working with this lady, but knows he needs to out of necessity. Again, a good change from the standard video game trope of everyone works together because we're suddenly all friends. Now, inside the base camp are some large flashing boxes. Interacting with them opens a store. I don't know what this stuff does, and honestly, while I could spend some time here and figure it out, I actually want to go and do the radio tower mission, so I just buy an assault weapon upgrade magazine and equip it. Quick glance at the skill tree. I have some unspent skill points, apparently, so I click on a skill and nothing happens. I try again for a bit longer and nothing continues to happen. Maybe I need to unlock something first. The game hasn't told me about this system yet, so I'm not too concerned. Plus, I seem to be doing fine without it. I am such a good driver. I am an average driver. I am going to walk. Reaching the radio tower and another player seems to be doing the same mission, confirming the earlier theory. If you and another player are in the same area doing the same mission, the quest will be automatically shared. You don't need to start a party. As she activates sub-objectives, they finish for me too. And running through this compound with another person shooting down the sentry guns and then destroying the generators was actually really fun. The NPC lady I'm escorting needs some time to fix the radio tower, so we are tasked with defending the control room from waves of enemies. The other player is still with me, and I had a great time with this mission. She took one door, I took the other, we just mowed down wave after wave of enemies, but I never felt too safe. I knew a few melee enemies could mess me up, and if I didn't keep shooting, we'd quickly be overwhelmed. We have to leave the room quickly, fix another relay box, and return. I decide that dynamic entrance is the only way, and ride my vehicle straight into the room and run some mutants over. Once you've finished with a mission, you don't need to start the next one right away, but if you open your map, the main story mission is obviously highlighted and easy to see. I'm enjoying this, so on we go. I feel cool while driving, weaving in between rubble and debris, but then I hit this post and it sounds like I ran over a rubber duck. Let's talk about Arc Falls. An Arc Fall is a timed event where a large chunk of stuff falls from the atmosphere and crashes into the ground. Then a load of hell bugs appear and swarm around it. If you can defend the Arc Fall for long enough and kill the large boss hell bug at the end, you get valuable loot. 
They're great fun because each bug acts differently. You've got small quick ones that are best dealt with with a shotgun, flying ranged ones that need a machine gun, massive melee tanky ones that need you to get behind them and shoot a weak spot, and fire breathing ones that should be avoided. It makes for an actually interesting battle. The first Arc 4 mission has me working alongside the Arc Hunters Josh and Erissa and they're totally capable of holding their own. Many times they actually save me. It's nice to see some good AI for a change. Finishing the first Arc 4 mission gives me the Arc Hunter outfit and it looks sweet. More missions and I finally find my sniper rifle and it's everything I expected it to be. The hitboxes on the enemies are super accurate, headshots are spot on and I never feel like I missed when I actually shouldn't have. The only thing starting to get on my nerves are the very limited voice lines. The captain says the same thing before each mission and then the ego unit has like three lines that she cycles through. This game feels like a single player experience but in a good way. Most MMOs rely on other players to create fun, like Life is Feudal or New Frontier, but this is giving me really strong Borderlands vibes, an actually designed story. It's just a great core gameplay loop. Yeah, I know it's mostly go to a place and shoot a thing, but when the travel is decent, the places are well designed and the shooting of things is so damn solid, it's just a really good loop. Headshots also damage elite enemies just as much as regular enemies, which makes aiming actually matter. I've been playing about five hours now and I am not even beginning to get bored. Then a boss bug spawns and this is the most intense fight I've been in. It's just excellent. The boss has several attacks that are telegraphed fairly, not too long, not too short, giving me just enough time to roll out the way if I pay attention. It never lets up, I never feel safe, but I never feel overpowered. This is a fair fight between Space Cowboy and Giant Bug. If they made a Starship Troopers game, I feel it should be like this. The next mission says go north, so I go north. I don't even question it, I want more gameplay. Discover a hut full of dead bodies and the ego unit lets me know they've had their cerebral fluids, that's brains, sucked out. So apparently this actually is Starship Troopers. I'm doing my part. Quick note on shotguns. Up close they are the most damaging gun by a country mile, but if you're a few meters away from your enemy they fire literal confetti. You cannot do any damage at all with a shotgun from over medium distance. Check out this lovely touch. When you free a soldier, they actually whip out a gun and join the fight. I love this. It means freeing a hostage is a tactical choice because I'm basically giving myself backup. Then the best firefight so far happens. This absolutely massive skirmish. On one side you've got me and the abandoned human soldiers. On the other you've got wave after wave of mutants and sometimes bugs show up and attack both sides. I know these are all NPCs, but this whole fight is such a great set piece. And finally, after a valiant last stand, I am taken down. So let's see what happens when you die without a revive. Restarting in a firefight places you at the nearest respawn point. It refills your ammo and pretty much lets you get back in instantly. Now there's a few issues with this system, both good and bad. The bad first, if I can instantly rejoin a fight then the loss doesn't really mean much. I have no real motivation to stay alive if death is quickly negated. But on the other hand, the firefights are so intense and fun that I'm super happy I get to rejoin them instantly. Plus my main motivation to stay alive is simply because I want to. I want to prove I'm better than the enemy. And none of my deaths felt cheap. I died when I made a bad decision or when I stopped watching my back. My deaths were my fault. I jumped down into a bad tactical place or I let someone sneak up on me. Back on the main quest and we continue searching for Science Man's Beacon. I level up my runner just by driving it and I like this system. You get better at stuff by doing stuff. This cutscene did highlight something odd though. This female character uses so many not swear words. She's clearly swearing but they can't actually say bad words so they replace all the bad words with vaguely sounding sci-fi words like Jack. Battlestar Galactica and Firefly did the same thing using Frack and Gosa so it might just be a sci-fi thing. 
I get to drive the not swearing lady's truck and it handles exactly as it should. Slow and lumbering but super good at running stuff over. I take a diversion from the main quest and drive to a local Ark Fall event because I actually want to. I smash the truck into a bug, bail out and start shooting. This whole experience from arriving to defending and then finally winning was just brilliant. Boss bug taken down, back to the main quest. My plan is to drive my runner into these guys, dive off and throw a grenade, taking them all out and looking cool. Let's see how well that goes. Didn't go exactly as planned. The game takes me to my first instance away from the shared overworld, fighting through this small installation with Cass. Apparently that's her name. The gameplay loop of Defiance at its core is really basic. It's advance, shoot enemies, then advance, but it's so tight and well realized that it's still fun seven hours in. This game knows exactly what it wanted to be and it went for it. Make our way through the facility and now I need to defend Cass while she fixes stuff and we get attacked. And honestly, they've got the balancing perfect. I can win if I focus, but if I stop trying, I'll die. The difficulty curve in this game is excellent. Find Science Man, he's got the alien MacGuffin, Cass gets him out of here and I stay behind to cover them. Game again gives me access to a super powerful weapon for a short time. This time it's a power fist, so I spend a few minutes cosplaying as a space marine. Eight hours in. Normally this is the time I'd stop playing, but I just wanted to cover a few more things and I'm glad I did. The next story mission needs me to be one level higher than I am. Now you might have noticed these glowing orbs, they are side missions and challenges that can earn you experience, so I accept one and it's a time trial rally mission. I get to drive this Dodge Challenger through rings and at first I'm worried thinking it'll be a crappy car mini game, but honestly the controls are spot on. However, I don't quite make it all the way, I get shot, blow up, respawn miles from home in a much higher level and get shredded in seconds. So what's the verdict? This video series is called Worst MMO Ever and Defiance 2050 is far from that. From my short experience, it's actually a really solid game. If you've played this for a long time and you know why it's so poorly received and why the player base is so low, then let me know in the comments. To finish the review, I award Defiance 2050 Power Fist out of 10. Cheers for watching! If you want more Worst MMO Ever videos, then drop a like or sub to the channel. A massive thank you to my Patreon supporters and Twitch subs who make all my videos possible. And comment down below with any game you think deserves the title. Check the video description for links to the Patreon, Twitch, Twitter or Discord. And as always, have a great day.